Thank you. So we're looking for those that um, may have not been here from the beginning. We're studying the book, Spiritual uh, Celebration of Discipline, The Path to Spiritual Growth by Richard uh, Foster. And so he outlines for us in the book and reminds us to the fact that if we're going to be Christians, strong Christians, if we're going to be able to go how we ought to go, that we must practice some disciplines. Disciplines are difficult. Um, that we know in life, and so the disciplines help us to grow spiritually as Christians. And of course, my charge and my desire um, is for greater peace to be spiritually disciplined, um, for greater peace to be on point and to, to, to grow. Just so you all know, the disciplines are meditation, prayer, fasting, study, simplicity, solitude, submission, service, confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. And so when we looked at it, we started with meditation. Uh, we discovered that meditation is something, the fact where uh, meditation is different from prayer. Meditation, we talked about, you're, you're just spending time with God. You're listening to God. That's meditation. But prayer, not only are we listening to God, but we're also talking to God, yet at the same time. And so meditation was something that we said that we must sit in silence and kind of gather and allow ourselves to learn and to listen and be in some solitude places in order for us um, to be able to spend time with God, to meditate. The Bible says, let us meditate on God's word day and night. And so that's meditation. Uh, good evening. The, the, the lesson is on. Thank you. God bless you. Um, so tonight we're looking again at prayer. If you have the packet there, we're looking again at prayer. 
So prayer, again, is one of the aspects of Christian faith that seems overwhelming um, to some people. Even those who have walked with Jesus for a long time admitted the difficultness in prayer. And that if we're honest, again, remember we said that the, the disciples at one time said, Jesus, help us to know how to pray. Um, and so we asked the question and got different answers um, about the aspect we're going to dig deeper about. Is there more than one type of prayer? Um, if so, what are they? And so we're going to kind of look at those things on tonight. But prayer is critical. Uh, how are we supposed to pray? Where are we supposed to pray? What are we supposed to say? Uh, am I using the right words? Is it just as simple as talking to God? And why should we do it? All of those questions we're going to answer and kind of dig in tonight and make sure that we're able to comprehend and see what we discover in these uh, lessons. Uh, Richard Foster in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, says to pray is to change. Don't miss that. We're on the first page. To pray is to change. Prayer is the avenue. We're in the introduction. Prayer is the, av the central avenue that God uses to transform us. Uh, this view of prayer is difficult for some to understand, but prayer is the main mechanism, the main way that we get God to transform us. So prayer is, is not only... See, see let me, the reason it's difficult to understand is because so often uh, people think of prayer as, a, as really just asking God for what they want, asking God for what it is they need. But prayer is also a way that God transforms us, that God changes us, that God helps us. And throughout scriptures, we see many prayers, many godly men, godly women in the Old Testament, the New Testament pray. And so we'll kind of look at and kind of see those prayers. So towards the bottom, where it says prayer open, think about some of our own frustrations with uh, frustration with or confusion about or obstacles to prayer. Let's, that's the part where you can jump in. What obstacles do you have with prayer? What frustrations or difficulties that comes with uh, praying? Anybody want to jump out there? Pain. Pain. What else? What, what kind of prevents uh, from praying? What kind of what difficult occurs when you're trying to pray? What sin? Sin. Good. Good. What else? What obstacles? What roadblocks? What issues? Fatigue. Fatigue. Fatigue? Good. Good. What else? Death. Death. Good. Good. What else? Be upset. Uh, being upset. Good. Good. What else? Anybody else? <coughs> Heal. Financial. Financial. Good. So, and what we see is there's a lot of obstacles. There's a lot of difficultness um, that, that it comes time to pray. Again, time, uh, fatigue, being too tired to pray, not having enough time. Um, and, and, and one, should you pray when? Because mom had, had a good one. We may come to it. Should you pray when you're angry? Can you pray when you're angry? Is it a good time to pray when you're angry? Yeah, I think so. Oh, so. Yeah, I think it'll calm you down. Calm you down. You know, you trying to pray, then you got all this stuff on your mind. How easy it is. That's great. That's why I want to dwell on How easy is it to pray when you're angry? Oh, oh, because as mom said, this, everything that you're, you're angry about is trying to rush. It's before, you know, while you're trying to pray, you're, the, the things are thoughts. Um, and, and the reason I want to kind of makes sure we hit that, is that that's a great time when you're angry before you pray to just meditate. Remember, spiritual discipline one was meditation. meditation. And so if you meditate and then let God kind of dwell and speak through you through the Holy Spirit, then it allows you to be able to go in and enter and pray to, you know, calm you down and so on. Great, great, great discussion. So all of these things kind of prevent us. Of all the spiritual disciplines, number one, prayer is the most central because it ushers us into a perpetual communion with the Father. If you, don't, if you miss anything, don't miss that one. Prayer out of all the disciplines we named. There's so many more that we're excited about, fast and solitude, so on. But um, this one is one of the most, is the most central because it ushers us into a communion with God, the Father. Prayer is the central avenue to use the trick. And we just said to transform us. If we're unwilling to change, we will abandon prayer um, as not a critical or central characteristic of our lives. Don't miss that. 
if we if people don't want to change, they're never going to have a strong prayer life. Mm -hmm. Because in talking to God, God reveals some things and shows us some things that lets us know how we ought to change, why we ought to change, um, and the difficultness in changing. Number three, um, you ask and do not receive because sometimes we ask wrongly um, to spend it on our own passions, to ask rightly involving involved in foreign passions and prayer, real prayer, we begin to think God we begin to think God's thought after him, to desire the things that he desired. What does all that say? To love what he loved. All that said, remember Jesus said, if thy let thy will be done. And so we have to remember that our prayer, we want to get in line with God. We want God uh, uh, to be in line with him. We want to have his thoughts, his desires. We want his will to take place. And so if we're asking wrongly if we're not asking with the desire or the passions um, to be of, uh, of God, then sometimes God says he does not hear, he does not receive, does not receive. And I'm smirking because all week long I've been getting the same question over and over again at work and from my friends. Y'all know what that question is? Uh, all week. It's been all week, you know. Is it all right for me to go and try to get that $1.6 billion in the rocket? <laughs> Can I pray for the numbers? You know, I've been getting that question all week. All week. So I'm not going to tell you how I answered it, but I've been getting it all week. Yes, sir. Well, Pastor, I didn't call you because what I figured if I won, I would go ahead and build the church. So I all right, all right. I figured I've been forgiven. Been forgiven. Yeah, I've been forgiven. That's a good passion. That's a good passion, man. man. I can't, I can't remember when it first, a lot of it first started in Georgia. It was all about what the Hope Scholarship. Mm -hmm. I came down from Jersey and I played the lottery. And, and Granddad, you know, he said, he's played the lottery. That's gamble. I said, Grand, I'm just trying to help people get scholarships. I'm just trying to, <laughs> and now I'm trying to help the kids go to school, no, Granddad. Send somebody to college. Send somebody to college. They're my kids. But so that, that's the question. want to make sure we pray with the right intent, not for us. Um, just to have selfish gains, but to be in line with God for God's desires. And so all who have walked with God have viewed prayers as the main business, the main business of, um, of, of their lives, the main business. Somebody go to Mark 1 and 4, 1 and 35. Mark 1 and 35 and read that. Make sure you underline that or highlight or keep in track. Everybody that walked with God that we see in the Bible, at prayer as the main business of their lives, not as a second thought. Sometimes we have prayer as a second thought. But prayer is the main business of our Christian lives. Anybody have Mark 1 and 35? Let's read that. And in the morning, rising up a great cup before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. That's it. And so, we're talking about our Savior Jesus went out. He got up early in the morning and, and long before daylight, went out to party. So let's know that Jesus understood the importance of praying. He understood the importance of separating from those distractions. He understood the importance um, as God the Son uh, of, of being in commune with God. And so Jesus had prayer, don't miss this, as a major part of his life. God the Son, God in flesh by way of the Son, had Prayer as a central point of his life. And let, let me go ahead. So let me ask you this. If every day before you go to bed you pray, does that describe you having a prayer life? Just every day before you pray? Every day before you go to bed. That's the only time you pray all day? It's the only time you pray all day. No. 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 I mean, I pray a lot. Is that what y'all said? <laughs> no, because the day when they start, I heard a news about the bomb. Mm -hmm. I was cleaning the bathroom, and I said, oh, I need to get on my knees. I said, well, Lord, I'm not, you know, I just start, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. start then right. because he in this world, because, There's I mean, you're scary. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent bombs to the clinic, the Obama, no former CIA director, CNN. Oh, the mail. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> oh, no, no, he's. No, he was just saying that the they receive bombs. You're sad. I mean, you're sad. So we take that moment to pray. So, like, so. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure I get so if you pray every day before you go to bed, mm -hmm. that means you, you still, that doesn't mean you have a prayer life. That's what we're saying. Prayer life is a good one. It's not very cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the prayer life is not very cool. Good point. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think so. You think so? Yeah. Mm. I was, I was thinking, it, it, it could be a good prayer life as long as you know, just do it on routine. Do it on routine and have it. Okay. You do it enough. Does the 
list of it have anything to do with it? Give you pray a little short prayer? Or does it have to be a long prayer? You talking about at night before you go to bed? Right. Yeah, I mean, what, yeah. <laughs> Whatever you want. Whatever time you want to put on it. And when I get in there, too. Before you get in there. And then wake up in the night and start all over again. <laughs> See, here's the catch in this. Uh, that we, you know, it's a prayer life. It just might not be a beneficial prayer life. Because if we're praying, and as a uh, young man said, if we're praying out of habit. Because remember, discipline is something natural as a habit. Yeah. And remember the example I gave to, to describe what discipline are that you don't have to think about it, you just do it is uh, blessing the food before we eat. That's a habit. Uh, for African Americans, you know, we've been brought up, you know, to pray before we go to bed. Whether we're not laying me down, whatever the case may be. And so it becomes a habit. But when you have an effective prayer life, you know, you're not only praying at night or even in the morning, but you're praying throughout the day. That, that there's no moment in time as you hear something on the news, you say, let's pray. Um, or, or something comes over you and say, let's pray. Or something comes over and say, you need to pray for. And this is where we want to be. So God may put in your mind, listen, you need to pray for Jane. And you right there, you begin to pray for Jane. Because we have a prayer life. It's just not a, a habit or habitual time that you pray. Um, you know, but you're constantly praying. Whenever you have the opportunity, you pray. And that God tells you um, sometimes who to pray for or what to pray for as well. Um, but Jesus, again, we see Jesus took the time, and he, Jesus showed us how important prayer is. Someone give us Psalm 63 and 1. Let's oh go God, to the Testament. Thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land. That's it. Where no water is. Early I seek you. Early I go to pray. Another verse says, Early I go to commune with you. Uh, my soul thirsts. That's how it ought to be that if we if we go without prayer so long that we ought to thirst to be in communion with God. Because remember, prayer is that commune with God. Is that commune with God. Listen, we'll never, ever be spiritually disciplined as Richard Foster wants us to be. We'll never grow spiritually. We'll never get to the level that we ought to be if we don't have that prayer life where we're communing with God and speaking with God. So the psalmist says, early I go. Seeking thee, and that was the desire. Acts 6 and 4. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. That's it. Um, and, and so, and that's just trying to set things up in order for, and that's really the creation of, um, of Deacon, set things up so that the apostle, the pastor, the preacher can set time aside not only for teaching but also for prayer. Because it goes together that if one's going to be a pastor or shepherd, um, and that's what we tell younger preachers that are coming, that prayer has to be integral. That we should never allow ministry or anything else in life to stop us from having a prayer life. And not just when we uh, go to bed at night. Um, the next page, Martin Luther says, I have so much business I cannot get on without spending three hours of daily prayer. Martin Luther, great theologian, great reformist, um, uh, 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 great theologian reform and said, I have to spend at least three hours in daily prayer. Can we be honest, sometimes it's difficult for us to spend three minutes in daily prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a true prayer life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a habit. And a great majority of the things that we do, oftentimes in church, is more habitual than spiritual. It's more a habit than a spiritual discipline. We do it because we brought up. We do it because we've been doing it all our lives. So even coming to church, a lot of people come to church not not for spiritual growth, but for the habitual aspect of coming to church. Uh, the power of prayer and our efforts to pray is easy for us to be defeated right on the outset because we've been taught that everything in the universe is already set, and so things cannot be changed. So if any things can't be changed, it's set, it's going to happen, we can't change it. Um, but if we pray, God can begin to shift some things. And if God shifts some things, then things will begin to change in situations and lives. So I want to read 1 Corinthians 3 and 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. That's it. 
we're God's fellow laborers. And so the Bible, uh, the Bible prayers as if the Bible prayers uh, prayed as if their prayers could and would make it, uh, a difference. Let me put it like this. Let me make it plain. We don't pray just to pray, but we pray in a manner that we believe it's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Let me cut across the field. You ever heard somebody pray? And if you're being honest, I know y'all are super spiritual, and you in the spirit, when they were praying, because they were praying, they were in spirit. But if you're being honest, you could tell that they didn't believe what they were praying for. Mm -hmm. it, the, the, there was no confidence in what they were saying while they were saying it. It's just like you can tell a person, not even praying, but talks, you can tell they have confidence about what they're saying. And man, I've heard prayers, man, that you can tell that they, they weren't even sure. They were just saying it just to say it. Meaning they're being specific in their mm -hmm. prayers. Yeah, specific in their prayers. And, and specific in the prayer for who the prayer is for, but also the conviction in their voice. That's why I don't, I, I don't allow everybody to pray for people when it comes to the altar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you can just tell some people don't believe it, they're just saying it because they believe that's what they're supposed to say. Mm -hmm. But I want people to pray that believe what they're praying, that you can hear it in their voice. You know, so I want people to pray for me that when I hear their voice, I begin to believe maybe that I didn't believe at first, but I'm beginning to believe what it is they're praying for. Because they have that conviction, that passion. It, they, they, they're saying that there's such power in their prayer. They believe it, and therefore they're praying as such. They're praying as such. And I tell younger pastors all the time that if you're praying, because for those that went with us um, to Reverend Grimes installation, you caught it. And Jeremiah, the Bible says, for those that didn't, let me give you the Bible says that, that God touched the lips, touched the mouth right. of Jeremiah, which indicated when you read the text, when you kind of study the text, when God put his hand on his mouth, what he did is he said that your mouth has power and authority. Let me put it another way, the, that the, the, it says the tongue has the power of what? Life and death. The tongue has power, and so we want to have that conviction when we're praying, like, listen, I'm praying, I'm believing it's going to happen. Or like the uh, Hebrew boy, that even if it does not happen, I pray like I know God can do it. Yes, sir. Even if you don't, I'm praying, God, I know you can do this thing. And so we must have that prayer, that prayer that has conviction and power inside of it. Learning to pray. Let's look at Luke 11 and 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying, in a certain place where he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Good. Thank you. Good. And so he says, disciples come and say, Lord, teach us. In other words, they said, I think I said part of this last time. But in other words, they said, Jesus, we see, Lord, we see your praying. We see how you pray. We see that it's different from what we're doing. Teach us how to pray. The way John taught his disciples how to pray. And Jesus then says, uh, so he said, so when you pray, say, go through the uh, the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is what? What prayer is this? The model prayer. The model prayer. Not, not, not the Lord's prayer, but the model prayer. That's the model prayer. The Lord's prayer was different when Jesus said, help us to be one. And so he says, he gives them this model prayer. And so I'm looking at him and saying, why is this the model prayer? Can we look at that for those who have your Bible or your phone or your app? Uh, let's see why this is the model. Why is this the prayer? See, sometimes you got to be nosy to the text. you got to be nosy to the Bible and ask the question, why would Jesus say that this is the model prayer, that this is the outline, this is the, the, the way prayer should go? Okay. Our Father who art in heaven, how be thy name. First of all, it's, 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 it's recognizing who God is and the power that God has. Your kingdom come, that God has authority, your will be done. In other words, submitting, saying, let thy will be done. Saying, God, I'm praying for this, I'm asking for this, but I want your will, I want to be in line with you. Saying that God's power is on earth and in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day, God. Uh, as our daily bread. Then look at it says, and forgive us of our sins. Every prayer, especially the first one, the last one, every prayer should include God, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of our sins. 
But then Jesus goes on to say, not only as, well, when he says, and for, forgive those who um, have sinned against us or trespassed against us. Thank you. Uh, as for we also forgive everyone who indebted to us or trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Don't miss that part. Jesus prayed. It's a model prayer because they say, look, look lead us not into temptation, that I lead me not into having to, to wrestle with some things, but then it says, and deliver us, deliver me from evil. Realize that as we're getting ready to go that day, that we're living in an evil world. So it's asking, but deliver. So we out, Jesus out, that's how important prayer is. We put that like that. There's a couple things in the New Testament that Jesus tells and shows how to do or how not to do. What are those? Just gave you one prayer. What do you think the other one is? What did Jesus teach in the New Testament on what to, well, how to do something or how not to do something? Baptism. Baptism. Baptism? Good. Close. Think about it. Who's going to be the star student for the night? <laughs> certainly, certainly. There's two things that Jesus, in essence, focuses on teaching. Two strong other things. He does some other things, but teaching the disciples and even us today how we ought to do something. Or how we ought not to do something. And the first one we're talking about is prayer. He just showed them the prayer. He gave the outline for prayer. What's the second one? Communion. Communion. That's Paul. Spreading the word. Spreading the word. That's the overall church. The other one, Bishop Cassidy, the other one is fasting. That's another spiritual discipline. His member, he tells them, do not fast as the hypocrites do. Looking as if you're fasting for you get the recognition from man about something you're doing, but it says wash your face, wash your eyes, dry your eyes, so you don't look as if you're fasting. That way you get credit from God in that sense and not man. So Jesus gives the importance of both prayer and fasting. Remember that's another discipline, coming fasting. He teaches how to pray. He teaches how to fast because they're just that critical. And again, in your study. Always pay attention to what, if Jesus is, is literally showing, it's great about the miracles. We love to read about the miracles. But Jesus is actually showing how to do something and how not to do something. That it must arrest our attention if he does that good. Um, I begin, again, we talked about praying for others with the expectation, number two, that change should and would occur. To understand that the work of prayer involves a learning process. Um, saves us from arrogantly dismissing it as false, unreal. There's, there's so many people out there that don't believe that prayer is real, that prayer does anything. There's many people out there that says it, it, everything that's going to happen is already going to happen. It's never going to change. It doesn't make a difference what we pray. They're still out there. And so we have to remain steadfast. Even when it does not seem God is hearing our prayers, we must still believe that prayer can change things and that God is still able. We say that, but it's difficult when you've been praying for a long time and praying over and over again, but yet God still has not allowed that prayer to manifest itself. We must, God say, I'm God, I'm still praying. I'm still seeking. I'm still praying. And let me, let me this gives me a way to um, say this. I've said it every year, probably three or four times a year either in Bible studies, sermons, lectures, or works. So I'm going to say it one more time, just in case somebody wasn't here. The other thousand times I said it. Stop. It's an old saying. I don't know where it came from. An old saying that says that God heard us the first time and that we don't need to keep asking God for the same thing over and over again. That, that's, a, that, that's contrary to this word of God. Where, you know, you want to be persistent. Paul said, I, the, Paul said, I pray to God. Um, uh, many times, but some say many times, some say three times, that he will what? Remove the storm from my flesh. It's not that we don't think God didn't hear us the first time, but we're, we're pleading with God. We're showing God that we're being persistent in what it is we want. So, you know, I, I, I've been asking God for the same thing for about a year now. And I'm going to keep asking. Um, not that I'm saying that I'm bothering him or that I don't think he's heard, but because I believe uh, to continue to go to him. One of the, number four, one of the most critical aspects in learning to pray for others is to get in contact with God so that life and power, we talked about that, can flow through others. We begin praying for others first 
um, as well. Number six, sometimes we are afraid that we do not have enough faith to pray for a child or marriage or pray for someone else. Our fear should be put to rest. But the Bible tells us that great miracles are possible through the faith. What? The size of a mustard seed. On the next page, the footholds of prayer. We should never make prayer too complicated. Jesus tells us to come, uh, the scripture was probably early on, come to God like a child goes to a father. Like a child goes to, that. that's how we have to be praying to God, like a child goes to a father. Jesus taught, number two, to pray for daily bread. Have you ever noticed that the children ask for lunch and other confidence that it will be provided? Children ask for food, whether breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or a snack, like they got confidence that they're going to get that snack. They're going to get that food. They, they, remember the model of prayer said, give us this daily bread. In other words, daily bread is saying simply, well, let me ask you, what do y'all think is meant by give us this they are daily bread? I think it means uh, give us a word. Give us a word. Good. Anybody else? Give us this day our daily bread. What does that mean by? What do we mean by that? twofold. I mean, I think, you know, because Jesus realized that we need that physical body needs to be taken care of so that we won't, so that that distraction will be taken away so that we can concentrate. You remember when they were out in boat and he, and he had came back after he resurrected, he took care of, because he can to talk to, um, to uh, Peter mm -hmm. and so he knew Peter was hurting so, but instead, so I think, you know, I think it's twofold. It's the thing talking about food, physical food, and spiritual food. Okay. Good. Anybody else? We're going to stand to make it through the day. Okay. Anybody else? essential to, to living, right? So he's saying, and you all said it in different ways all times, yeah? and that's it. He's saying, provide for me this day. Provide, provide this day. Give me what I need this day. Provide provision. In other words, he recognized that even in everyday life that we don't provide for ourselves, that God does the provision. And so he's praying, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, provide for us spiritually, but provide for us um, naturally. Provide for us food. Provide for us a way. Provide for us throughout the day, which, which, which all of you all said. And so that, that's why he's, this is the model prayer. Because, listen, I, I know we think we can make it every day. That we think that we've made it this day on our own, but God was providing. God provided um, not only breath, but God provided um, food. God provided finances every day. God Continue provides daily bread. Good, good. Um, number four, we need not to worry that this work will take up too much of our time. It's no time. In essence, it is not prayer in, in addition to work, but prayer uh, at the same time as work. Simultaneously with work, uh, we proceed together. I want to get to, I, I got to get to this. I want to do this. I got to get through at least two of these. So I'm going to go to Luke 18. That's what I'm hearing. Luke 18, 9 through 14. Keep that open when you have it. Luke 18, <clears throat> starting at verse number 9, 9 through 14. When he spoke this parable to some, he trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One of Pharisees and the other a tax collector. The Pharisees stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortionists, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. If the tax collector stands afar off, would not so much as raise 
raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Good. Thank you. So look at question one. What does Jesus... Did you read 14? Mm -hmm. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, thank you. What does Jesus say about the uh, about this the first man's prayer? Exalt yourself in the prayer group. What up? Anybody else? How does he describe his attitude? Not humble. Not humble. So look at it. He went in with this long prayer. God, I'm thankful that I'm not like such and such. I'm going into the prayer boastful. The second man comes in and says, What? Well, and that's God have mercy on me as a sinner. Is that what he said? <laughs> I'm not worthy, God. He says, God, be merciful to the sinner. Right. Um, and so. It wasn't a long one, I think the question, it wasn't a super long one, but it was powerful because he understood that he was a sinner. He understood that um, sin leads to death, but yet there was mercy. And so I know it seems tough, but it wouldn't be in the Bible. Jesus wouldn't have put it in there and said this, use this parable, if he didn't understand that that was some of the attitudes of people then and even today. There's people that, that, that even in their prayer, their prayer is boastful. But when I go to God, I'm saying, God, for the first thing we talk, forgive me of my sins, cleanse me. Recognize that he's God, but then recognize that we are a sinner. And so he, in essence, um, says, God, have mercy on me as a sinner. This is one sentence we see such a powerful prayer. Prayers, again, don't have to be extended. In one sentence, we see who God is and who we are. That one sentence showed who God is and who we are. That one sentence, that one sentence prayer nullified, in essence, that long prayer that the other brother prayed. Because the one sentence says that God is merciful. He's the one that forgives sins. And then it also says who we are, that we're sinners by nature. And so he came in with the attitude, came into the temple to pray. Remember, it started out that they both came, verse number what, 10, that the two men went up to the temple to pray. That's why they came to the temple to pray. And one man had one sentence. He came to the temple and simply said, God, have mercy on me as a sinner. So that is a that example of a, of a prayer, one prayer. What do you all think that prayer is? It's a servant's prayer. Hmm? Is it a servant's prayer? Servant's prayer? Close. Sinner's prayer. Sinner's prayer. That's example. Yes, yeah, so that so the question, the answer is tell your mama too, because she, she. I mean, I, I thought. Well, I know what it's been No, tell her because she said they weren't, she wasn't sure if they were different prayers. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> she wasn't sure if they were different prayers. Uh, so yeah, they're different prayers. This is an example of a sinner's prayer. <laughs> they, they're coming, and the the, the the rationale of the prayer is, is to acknowledge their sinful ways as a servant. Their sinful ways. What? Go ahead. Please jump in. What's the difference between a servant's prayer and a sinner's? prayer? A third prayer. We're gonna get to it. Oh, okay. We're gonna get to it. Great question. Look at the next page. Example number two. Someone read Isaiah chapter six, verse one through seven. Isaiah chapter six, verses one through seven. chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. In the year that King Uzziah, okay. Okay. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the throne of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, seraphim, with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying. And they were calling 
to one another, holy, 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 is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the Seraphim. Seraphim. Yeah, flew to me Seraphim. with a live coal in his hand, which he has taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins are turned to you. Good, thank you. So what what type of prayer is this? Everybody fell. If y'all don't get this, I fell in the whole, I fell in the whole class. Sinners prayer. Y'all think sinners prayer? Sinners prayer. 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 Sinners with the sinner's prayer, um, but theologically they would call it a prayer of repentance. Prayer repentance. Okay. The reason everybody fell is that it's at the bottom of the page. So first, let's look at it. Let's look at it. So again, similar to the prayer of the tax collector, which means their first cousin, their brother and sister. Isaiah recognized who God is and who he is. Just like the sinner's prayer, I mean, just like the previous prayer with the tax collector, Isaiah says, you know, who God is and who he is. Both men were made aware of their sinfulness. However, Isaiah gets specific about the sin in his life. The man in the tax collector, the man that was in the New Testament, he said, God, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Isaiah made it clear the sin in his life. Isaiah had been serving the Lord and hearing from the Lord yet still had sin areas that he needed to confess. Don't miss that part. Don't miss it. And so now he's repenting. He said, God, I, I, I got unclean lips, and I'm around unclean people and unclean things. In other words, Isaiah said, God, I'm, I, I'm not talking right. I ain't living right. The reason this one ought to jump out is because if we're honest, that's us at some points in our lives. Because he says, God, I've been certain. It looks as Isaiah has been serving the Lord. And hearing from God, he'd been serving because he was with King Uzziah. So the year King Uzziah died, God said, you've been walking with him, so you've been serving. You've been hearing me, but yet have been running. He said, the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. So Isaiah had been serving God, hearing from God, yet still had some sin areas in his life to confess. Confession is something that we do want to never struggle with it again. Confession or repentance should be a regular practice that allows God to show us the areas that are hindering our walk and growth. I can stay on this one for a minute because that's all of us as Christians. Isaiah, Isaiah wasn't in the world. Isaiah was close king, you know, to the king, and Isaiah had been hearing from God, serving God. But yet Isaiah said, God, listen, you're trying to take me, you're trying to help me to grow spiritually. God, I got some unclean lips. I'm around some unclean people. <laughs> There's some unclean stuff going on. God, I got to confess this. I have to repent for this. And he shows that God was will. God said, I got it. Let me take this coal. I'm going to purify. In essence, purify it. But he had to admit. He had to confess. He had to repent. And then God was able to remove the hindrances <coughs> or the things that was blocking his walk with life growing spiritually. Let me cut through this. Now. Somebody said it um, earlier on in some type of way. The main reason we don't grow spiritually is be for the lack of confession and the lack of repentance. Cut lack of confession and repentance of our own troubled areas, our own unclean areas, is the reason we don't grow spiritually. Confession Confession, 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 and repentance, repentance, repent is key. 
because we all know that favorite scripture. We've all seen it come through the glory of God. But Isaiah said, listen, I've been serving you. Well, God said, in essence, you've been serving. You've been coming. You've been serving. You've been hearing my voice. Isaiah said, yeah, but I, got, I still got some unclean ways. And, and that's, actually, that's actually one of the evangelism techniques I use when I tell They say, well, you know, I got the People don't want to come to church because they feel they're living bad. They feel, they, they know their unclean areas. I, I'm just, I can't come to, I'm just, I'm still dealing with some stuff. Well, listen, we, everybody, when you come through the door, everybody you see is dealing with something in their life. Got some unclean ways. Yeah, everybody. But I think the difference between us and you is we understand that we need to come to church, spend time with God, repent and confess for God to cleanse us. And then we're going to do it again because it's a continual thing. Everybody got struggles. That's why the prayer of repentance uh, uh, is critical. It's critical. And we see what is God's response. God said, God, let me purify. You're good. But he listens in what, and what sin? This is what I challenge you. What sins? Yeah, we know we all sin. Let me go ahead and cut deep. We all sin. We know we, we've sinned. But if we're honest, and I'm honest with, I'm, I'm talking about me as well, all of us, if we're honest, we're not, he's not even really talking about just sinning. He's talking about that I got some specific sins that I keep doing over and over again. Some issues, that they're, they're habitual. And this, in other words, he said, I got this area that I'm dealing with. Everybody got an area they're dealing with. Come to church. They got an area they're dealing with. And, and, and so he says, he confesses it to God. And so that's the example number two. Look at number three. How long is it? Somebody read Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee alone, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaken in inequity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hot sock, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin. And blot out all my inequities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and behold, uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressions thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall shew forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delighteth not in burnt offering, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, that will not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. With burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then shall they offer bullets upon thine altar. Good. Thank you. Thank you. How does David describe God? How does 
David described God for us? A loving, kind God. Right. A loving, kind. Say, God, you're a loving, kind God. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're, you're God that, 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 that loves so much, you're so kind that I can come to you in this way. First of all, what kind of prayer is it? Sure about that? Forgiveness. Prayer forgiveness. Prayer forgiveness. Prayer forgiveness. Prayer forgiveness. Prayer forgiveness. Remember now, all of these are first cousins. All of these are first cousins. That's that's why it seems like they're all interacting. But when you look at it um, on the theological side, they're probably different. So, um, but yeah, all of them are first cousins. But yeah, this is a prayer of forgiveness. Other prayer of repentance and the uh, sinner's prayer. But they're all. Uh, Kind of similar, but this is the prayer of forgiveness. So, he said, what, what did David ask for? David asked for forgiveness here. Creating him a clean heart. Why was David asking for forgiveness? Somebody got a chance to redeem themselves and become the star student. Why was David asking for forgiveness? He committed adultery with the sheep. Good. What else? What is that? Did he take the human? Did he go to heaven? What else? Why did why why was David ask? What, what was why why did David ask for forgiveness? Like said, David says because he had sinned, it had destroyed his relationship with God. He says, God, it's like you don't delight anymore. He said, he said, I, I don't feel I, I messed up. David, David ain't even worried about his kingdom. He's not, he's not worried about none of the. All David said, God, I just want a, a right. I want to feel your presence again. I want a right relationship with you, God. I, I, I got to get my relationship back with you, God. I desire to be close, and that's again a reminder of something I've said two or three times tonight that we say over and over again. Sin messes up the connection and the relationship we have with God. That's why all of these cousins of repentance and the sinner's prayer and the prayer of forgiveness are all important because sin breaks the connection we have with God and our relationship. I don't know. I don't know. Remember, Jesus is hanging on the cross. As he's hanging, what does he have on him? He has all of our sin. All of our sins are hanging on the cross with Jesus. And then one of the seven last words of Christ is, "What? why have thou forsaken me? Because all of that sin that he had on him, in essence, had to make God have to turn his back on him. Because God cannot be in alignment and connection to have a relationship with sin. That's why there's no spiritual growth. That's why there's temptation, falling into temptation. That's why there's no struggle. That's why it seems like, in essence, you started out on five and you're supposed to grow, and now you're at 5.2. Because what we have to realize is that sin cuts us off. God, God turned, yeah, we're all his children, but this is God, the son. God turned his back on Jesus. He couldn't look at him. He couldn't be around because he had all that sin on him. God cannot be around sin. He's too much of a pure God in order to do that. So that's why David said, God, I know you left me. And that's David's God. And that's what David said, God, you cut me off. My sin is always before you, against you. Um, you Have I sinned? I've done wrong. Um, behold, I desire. He says, wash me, God. Cleanse me. Wash me whiter than snow. Verse number seven, purify me. Cleanse me. Make me hear joy and gladness. Um, and be satisfied. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Say, God, hide, hide, I, I know I've sinned. Hide, hide your face from it. Blot it out. Take it away. Because it, it, it's stopping me from having a relationship with you. And let me say this. The reason David is so passionate. We'll stop here and do the other ones later. The reason David is so passionate is because David knew what a relationship with God was like. God had always been with David. Little shepherd boy fighting Goliath and so on, running um, from Saul, running uh, from his own son. God had always been with David. God, David had always felt what? The presence of God. And then when it was cut off, he said, I can't take this. 
And that's how we ought to be that when it seems like we don't have that connection with God, we ought to say, I can't take this. God, forgive me, cleanse me, purify me, wash me, blot out my transgressions that I can get closer to you. As the dear panthers, Father, for the water, my soul, and that's another song, longs after thee. And that's what prayer ought to do. So we'll look at the other two and finish up prayer and then get to the um, next spiritual discipline. We have uh, two more two more types of prayer that we'll look at and finish up prayer, wrap that up, and then uh, get to the other spirit. The next one is fasting. You don't, fasting and study. Don't miss those two. Fasting and study are the next Fasting and spiritual discipline and study the next spiritual discipline. Let us stand. Any prayer requests for tonight that we can take to the Lord? These petition type of prayer. Family for uh, Sister Lisa and Sister Raven and Sister J.R. Uh, so they're on and great off. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other prayer requests? My grandson in Louisville, Kentucky, in the hospital. Grandson Louisville, Kentucky, in the hospital. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Sister Atkinson. I'll let you know that I can sit in of our church. Anybody else? Pray for the healing of my body. These two shots I took today are beneficial. Mm-hmm. Healing of the body, certainly. Thank you. Anybody else? And my brother? Brother, certainly. He couldn't have hung his chair today. Brother, thank you so much. Anybody else? Let us pray. God, we come at this moment, this time, realizing who you are, and that you are God, that you are God of loving kindness, that you are God that has all power. We come, God, tonight realizing that we're sinners, but first, God, foremost, we ask for your forgiveness, forgiveness of our, our sins, our wrong thoughts, our wrong actions, and our wrong doings. And God, we even ask that you forgive us that we don't have enough faith sometime in you to even pray in a way of conviction that you're able to do it. God, you've heard the various prayer requests. You've heard the name. You've heard the situation. And God, I don't have to repeat it, but you know all of them. So, God, you know that if healing is needed, you know if strength is needed, you know if miracles are needed, you know if recovery is needed, you know if peace is needed. Yes. God, whatever it is, you know whatever is needed, God, you've heard the request. You've heard the petition yes. from these, your children, on behalf of themselves and on the behalf of others. So, God, I ask that you just intercede now, Jesus, on the behalf of these that have requested that you would go before God and go before the throne interceding. Yes. Because we're asking that these blessings, these healings, these fixing and delivering be done in the name of Jesus. So, in the name of Jesus, God, we ask now for healing. We ask for strength. We ask for peace. God, we ask that you touch families of grief. God, we ask that you give open doors, Father, that for those that seem to be blocked out of situations, God, pray for them. We're praying now for this world. For you said in your word, if we humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways and humble ourselves. And and that's it, bow before you. Then you shall hear our prayers. So, God, we pray for this country. We pray for evilness, God, and ask that you would allow goodness and love to overpower evilness, God. We pray for this election coming up, God, that you would allow the candidates to get in that has a heart for you. Yes. Father, we thank you in advance for what you shall do, that you bless every prayer. God, I thank you tonight that there was enough faith by these, your people, to request something on behalf of themselves, on behalf of their family members, on behalf of their friends. God, reward not only them, bless not only them, but bless all they prayed for, that they understand, God, that there is power in prayer, and that you're able to change circumstances and situations. Change now, God. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Bless you.